What's up guys, it's Gary with Fresh From The Farm Fungi. I'm here in Denver, Colorado, and today I wanted to talk about the importance of workflow in mycology. So um, one of the biggest hurdles that I see new people come across is when they start to try to do too much um, with their grow. So what I'm talking about is um, when people start off growing mushrooms, um, often they'll get super excited and they'll want to start doing, you know, culture work, making their own spawn, um, fruiting out their own mushrooms, and they're, you know, working at such a small scale that oftentimes they'll try to, you know, fit this all into one tiny little area. And I'm all for vertical integration. Um, personally here, we breed most of our cultures from spore and then work our way up. We produce all of our own spawn. We fruit all of our own mushrooms in, the, in our own grow tent and it's all in the same area. However, um, within that area, there are specific micro, um, micro areas or I like to think of it as little tents of workspace. So um, I even started off in a four by four tent and I recommend that if you don't have the grow space to have separate rooms, like this is my laboratory, um, then start off in tents and form little modulars to separate the different parts of your process. It's going to help you understand the workflow and it's gonna help you get a lot better results. So um, first thing in the morning that I'll do is I'll come down, um, check off my you know checklist, and I actually I start off with doing Etsy's. Um, so shout out to everyone to check out our Etsy Fresh Fungi. Um, and the reason I do that is so I don't miss the mailman. Um, but after that, I will take a shower and focus on my laboratory work. So it's really important to get your lab stuff done out of the way so that you can pick your mushrooms and then you don't have to go backwards into your lab. So I like to think of the workflow as like the human body. So you're only gonna get um, as good of mushrooms as the substance that goes into the system. So that means that you have to have really good quality cultures to start with and then you have to produce really good quality um, grain spawn and then you have to produce really good quality grow bags and then you have to fruit your mushrooms in a really clean environment. So the way to achieve that is to only start at one end of the system and maintain sterility all the way through the process. So if you're doing everything in one tiny little grow tent then you're going to have a lot of problems because when you get to the fruiting phase all of that contamination that could be you know um, acquired from the fans or the misters is going to go backwards into the system and you're not going to be able to correct that unless you start over from scratch so i created this little um, flow chart for a lab specifically but this can be applied to um, the entire grow operation. If you think carefully about planning your system, you're not gonna run into some of the errors that people um, often come to me with, like, all right, so my grain spawn looks clean, but I transferred it into my bulk bags, and now all my bags are contaminated. And then I'll ask them, all right, well, what does your space look like where you're doing your bulk inoculations? And often, it's the same area as um, where they're fruiting their mushrooms and this is going to create a problem where it's going to be impossible to get you know 100 percent clean inoculations every time so i'll just break down um, kind of how i design my laboratory and you know this is just a generalization I don't like to specifically show my grow space because that kind of pigeonholes everyone into copying exactly you know how I do things which I don't think 
that I'm doing things the best way possible, um, but for my situation that I'm in right now, it's working well. But moving forward, you're always gonna wanna make improvements, and to me, you know, maybe 10 years from now, I'll do a tour of my lab, but right now, it's just not optimal, so um, I'll just explain, you know, my thought process behind things. So, after I take a shower, I would enter my laboratory, and I have my lab coats ready. So, first things first is you want to leave your dirty clothes behind and put on, you know, a designated laboratory um, garments, whether that's a lab coat, like what I use, or scrubs, or even just like a clean um, t-shirt with shorts. Just make sure that you have a designated clothes that you're not carrying from all over your house to go into your laboratory. So that would be this area right here, which is, I call it the garment area. So oftentimes you'll see like sticky mats on the floor or um, foot wash stations or um, areas where you would put on a hairnet and a beard cover. And um, when I used to work in Centennial, I would wear a full BSL-3 suit. So there would be like a helmet with a HEPA filter. And this all took place in this room here so that you're not getting dressed in the body of your laboratory. So moving on from the garment area, you would have a vestibule, or for me, it's just a storage rack. So this is where you're gonna keep all of your laboratory supplies. So the reason that you keep them here and not you know, downstream in your lab is because often I'll get packages from Amazon and you know, my other laboratory suppliers. And when those packages come in, the outside is dirty. So I'll often you know, take them down um, to this area right here before my laboratory, unbox them, and carefully move them quickly onto the shelf. So that's gonna create a cleaner environment for your lab because you're not tracking in microbes that are coming through the mail or through um, the packaging. You can even go as far as creating um, a pass-through, which a lot of BSL-3 or BSL-4 labs require that so that it doesn't bring any, any contaminations into the whole clean room. So what a pass-through is, is just an airlock. Like if you've seen on you know, the space station or something, one door will close, the dust will settle, the other door opens. And often you know, there could be an air shower or what we used to do is spray off any items that were entering the laboratory with sporicide or alcohol so it killed any contaminants on the surface and then you would leave it in there for a specific amount of time and then once you got into the lab you would open up your item so that it's essentially clean to get into the laboratory. So as you work your way into the lab you're going to enter just the body of the laboratory. So this can be as small as, you know, a little still air box, or it could be as large as, you know, an entire facility. Like when I worked in the hospitals, there would be, you know, 200, 300 square feet of bench tops where we were all working with our samples. Um, so this is kind of the workspace. So you want to design this area so that you're not moving around um, often, which was, or which could potentially create dust particles rising off the floor. So minimize movement in this space. And for me, um, this could also be, you know, an incubation space. So if you're limited on space, then maybe you put your incubation space inside your laboratory so that you know you're minimizing contamination, but the important part about this is if it's in your laboratory, you're gonna have to stay really observant because you don't want any contaminants to break out here and then work their way into your culture. So you can see here on my laboratory design, the cleanest space would be the workspace in front of the flow hood. So this is kind of like um, just a wet bench, which means that it's not sterile. So this is where I'll you know have my computer and kind of check things in and out like when I'm doing my Etsy orders um, I'll often just set them up on this space here 
while the incubation space is on the opposite side so that the air is flowing through this you know workspace so the cleanest part of your laboratory is going to be your flow hood um, work workbench so this is you know where I'll begin my day so if I'm going to be transferring cultures or making liquid cultures or um, inoculating spawn I'll start with this process first thing because I just took a shower I just put on my fresh lab coat and then I walk through the lab straight to this area so even the night before I'll set up my workstation so that I don't have to fuss around with creating you know air currents and debris inside my lab so these are all things that you should consider when you're working in mycology um, and then the last part of the lab is where I keep my cultures so um, for long-term storage I'll use slants and for my working cultures I'll just use petri dishes and I have a separate incubator um, this provides a, a continuous environment which is ideal for my working cultures and then I'll have my um, long-term storage cultures in a refrigerator so that I can use them you know six or eight months down the road um, and that way I don't have to have you know continuously transferring my samples onto new petri, di pre petri dishes which allows for more risk for contamination to enter the system so I hope this makes sense. Um, I'm trying to create an ideal, um, an ideal setup in general, but this is just for the laboratory and you can extrapolate this to include, um, you know, I would include the storage area or possibly move my incubation outside the laboratory and then have, you know, the fruiting area either in a completely different building or in a completely different room or you know if it if you don't have the space you can just set up like a modular system with different tents so um, I hope that makes sense um, give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video subscribe if you're looking forward to more mycology videos like these um, and tune in to fungi Friday um, every Friday at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, I'll go live, answer questions in real time, or um, I'm al also doing like lab work on my Fridays, so sometimes I'll just film, you know, my laboratory procedure for the day, and I have a bunch of different projects started for the spring, so I'm super excited to um, update as those projects progress. So I've got a bunch of chanterelle uh, porcini and um, king stropharia that i'm just getting going and in, uh, in spawn today so that's what i'm about to do i'm going to be expanding those cultures and then doing some outdoor gardening probably at the end of april or early may I'm usually super excited to get my garden going and I always make the mistake of planting way too soon and then have to fill in gaps as you know we get a freeze or some extreme weather here in Colorado so I'm trying to hold off until May um, so we'll see about that but I got some raised beds that I'm going to be doing a video on those and also I'm going to be experimenting with capturing the humidity from my fruiting chambers to further extend the energy that's created in that system. So on this sheet, maybe it might look like my fruiting tents and then at the very end, it would be these raised garden beds that I'm gonna attempt to grow some outdoor mushrooms this year. So um, stay tuned for that. Give us a thumbs up and until next time, much love.